Hi, good afternoon, Home Language, the FETs and SBs. This is your exclusive um, week two curriculum and CAPS document interrogation from me. It is Wednesday, the 15th of March, so we're a bit ahead of schedule. Um, this is for week two, um, and you'll need this learning event recording to answer your online tracking number two. Um, so let me get on with it. I hope you're all doing well and um, you've survived week one. Um, we look at a few of the um, the tasks, your survey, informal survey tasks, just to check up on how you are all feeling. Okay, uh, let me just share my screen with you. Here we go. Okay, yes. Um, week two, we're getting there. Um, curriculum documents for home language. Um, we all have to look at what's happening in the curriculum to teach English. And we have to take care of you up to date with the CAPS document so we know what's going on there. So it's a bit of integration between curriculum for language teaching and the CAPS document. So maybe after this learning event recording, you'll be a bit more affair with what's going on with CAPS. I hope so, at least. Just a quick um, overview. Um, this morning's tally, there were 74 FETs home, taking home language and 88 SPs. So the numbers are growing. Um, I think we're into late registration now. And I looked at um, quiz one, the reflection, and four FETs had answered the, um, the reflection task and seven of the SPs. So I'm starting to look at that. I also want just to take note that um, I have required 500 words and a picture. And my marking goes according to those words. So if you're only writing about 100 words, just know that you're not going to get very many marks. But it is only 1%, so don't stress about it. Um, I do ask for a picture or a symbol or imagery. So you do get marks for that. So just think about my wording when you answer your, your reflection task. Okay. So otherwise, you can see it is in red because that means the numbers are low. You've got until Sunday to complete the reflection one um, task and then I'll put the new um, statistics, statistics, statistics in and then we can actually check who, how many of you have actually done it um, next week. Okay. Yes, I'm sure many of you more will have completed that task. So let's just look at the roundup of week one, which is where we are now. Um, you had a few online um, informal surveys to do from how you're feeding to your your Kahoot quiz to your online tracking reflection task, which I've told you about, and then it's also the answer garden activities. This week, you've got an online tracking as well for two based on this learning event. You've got a mentee um, as well on your, how many of you got Ferreira. I've also got a second mentee there saying how many of you have completed the tasks. And there's also a Golani case study, which I'll talk about now in this learning event. So how are you feeling? Okay, hope you're feeling great. But let's see what you said on Menti. I'm going back. Yes, I think there's only a few of you that had done it. I'm hoping that there's going to be more. I'm just trying to move this. Yeah. So although most of you felt excited because that's the biggest font, which is quite nice, there were a few of you that were stressed, nervous, and anxious, cautious, and worried. So that seems like the overriding feeling is a bit stressed and negative. But um, hopefully the excited, intrigued, happy, and hopeful, energized people will be the overwhelming majority at the end of this. And I get to know how all of you are feeling as you approach this new academic year. Okay, so thanks for sharing with me. Um, as I've said, that I'm just trying to get this to move again. Yes. Look at the Kahoot Challenge. Um, this closes on Sunday night. Uh, I you'll see there the dates at started on the 23rd of February and um, 22nd of March it closes. So far um, I've seen there are 23 of you that have actually done it. Remember, I don't know who you are. If you've put pseudonyms in, that's fine. Um, it goes about how quickly you answer and how many you get right. So top of the pops now is Carisha E um, and Lobali. You both got 100%, but I think um, Carisha was just a bit faster there. It's your higher points. And going right down to Kony and G. Um, although you got tenth rank, um, G, you got eighty percent of your answers right. It's just the timing thing that got you that. So I'll put the final finale in um, next week, so you can see you came top of the pops. Okay. So well done to all of you that have done this. I don't think it was too difficult at all. Answer Garden is also now going through the the um 
filling in stage. I've seen quite a few have done that. If you look at the um, FET, it seems to be far fewer than the um, the um, SPs, but this is your key elements to advertise, uh, to analyze the advertisement. And you can see the biggest um, font is audience or target audience. Um, that is important element to look at. But then if you look at the font size, you can see language and product also came up there as well as images. Um, and then the smaller font was the size of the font, the words, the text type demographics, um, which were lesser, um, few of you put those down. As you can see for reading, improving your vocab, reading was tops there. Most of you said read. Reading, but there's also things like word games and um, there you go, word games. It's going down smaller is your scrubble. Conversations also there, listening to the radio. Um, going down small is listening to Audible. I love Audible, so it's my companion when I go walk. But all kinds of things that you've said that will actually enable you to build your vocabulary. And I think all of these are quite important. So I hope you're going to go and look at this and study what has been said, fill in the gaps, word of the day, plain wordle, all these things that you do are so important to develop your vocab. Okay, do you have a textbook? I have not many of you have answered this, but hopefully that this week you're going to get to it. I think for the, I've got this, the slides of the TFF, but there's only two of them. Um, I think there are three of you for THF that have actually got Ferreira. Remember, we refer to this all the time, so I'm hoping that these numbers will improve. Um, if you get a secondhand one someone, somewhere, we actually refer to it all the time, so you actually do need it. Okay, there's your oats oh, 3 THF, and so that makes me a bit concerned that so few of you have got it, but maybe all waiting for deliveries. Um, let me know if there are any issues. Okay, unit one, um, we're going to look at teaching methodologies, language interrogating um, caps, and curriculum documents, which we're looking at tonight. Um, there's your prescribed reading, um, your caps document, Ferreira and Clean, which I've spoken about. And those are the two covers, along with the caps document, which has also been uploaded already onto Canvas. Please note, um, I have a few queries about um, why is everything the same? I don't want to answer the same questions for my assignments, but they're not the same. So I'm just going to try to explain a few things to you. I'll also be speaking to you about this um, next week in the Zoom session. It's a face-to-face -face with you all. And I'm going to I've called it welcome and queries. So all the queries that are coming through and you can ask questions, um, things you're not too sure about, things I take too much for granted that I think you all know, which you don't know. Um, hopefully we'll address all those things. So there's really not a rigid difference between home and additional languages. Those of you that are taking home language and first additional language, there's no real rigid division. You still have to do the skills. You still have to do speaking, reading, writing, and um, listening. So those, if you do first additional or you do home, you still have to do it. So the complexity changes um, and the depth changes, but the actual skills do not change. All right. So there's, you don't do a separate syllabus if you're doing home or additional languages. So for listening and speaking, home language will be more detailed. You, you'll expect more from home language people. Um, for first additional language, you will not challenge them as much cognitively. So more detail and more cognitively challenging on your listening that you have to listen to or your speaking topics, they will not be as complex for your first additional language. I think that makes sense as well. For reading and viewing, um, although they're both home language and first additional languages are informative in content, okay, but they are in different ways that they're informative. Home language is richer, but FEL will be more simplified. They might talk about the same thing, but home language will be more complex, maybe more difficult vocab, words that they use, maybe the style of writing, whereas it'd be more simplified if you're working with FEL. Um, in curriculum, in, in your SS1, 2, and 3, there are different levels that you will expect from a FEL and a home language. For writing and presenting, FEL normally presents the information in tabulated form. It'll be point form summaries, whereas home language is more descriptive. You'd rather require your students to write a paragraph or an essay, um, instead of listing points or bullets or dialogue, um, you'd expect them to use the language in a more coherent manner. But in all of this, um, language in education policy invites the use of more than one language in the learning and teaching and with this supports multilingualism. 
So if you are Afrikaans and doing additional language for English, that's good because the one sub one language supports the other. If you're good in your home language, you'll be good in your second language and vice versa. So there's no problem doing both home language and first additional because you've got different mother tongues and both are important. Um, complexity might change a little. Yes, so those of you that are concerned that all the topics are the same from 1 to 11, I think it is. Yeah, they all are. Um, you are doing interrogating caps and curriculum documents for home language. Um, in week two, week, you, week three, the community of language teaching is both for the home language and first additional, although in week three, they will also do second language acquisition. So you're all just speaking and listening. So we have to do the same skills, but complexity will change. So I'm quickly going to look at SS1, your, your um, CLT case study. And I've also had a student who said to me, oh, but they're both the same. Yes, they are both the same, but the content is different for the case study. So for the FETs, it's on a short story structure, whereas for the SPs, it's going to be on a reading lesson looking at silly selfies. So different content, different case study, but both of them are looking at CLT, communicative language teaching. Okay, so that's your challenge. You're going to have a lot of questions that you're going to need to answer, and you're going to have to have pedagogic understanding to answer these questions. For instance, in question one, you've got to know what text-based teaching is. I spoke about this in um, week one. It's also in here. Go and check again what text-based teaching is. And we'll also look at Ferrero for what is communicative language teaching. So you have to know pedagogically what these two are so you can relate it to the case study. So it's not just answering a comprehension question, I mean, needing to have a comprehensive understanding of certain concepts when you are teaching a language. Okay, I hope that makes sense. I will also be having a SS1 overview of the actual assignment in next week. So I will go through all the aspects I need you to take note of, and hopefully this will help you understanding on how to answer. Okay, but I would invite you to go and read the case studies in the meantime, go and look at the questions, um, see what's required of you, so that when I do do the overview, you more, you've more a fair with what the topics are and what you might be not sure of and what you are wanting me to help you with more. So SP and FET, you both got a case study based on communicative, communicative language teaching. Um, you, I want you to go and look at Ferreira on the case studies on page 89 to 92. She's got examples there. Also particularly want you to go look at the CLT practices that she's listed there. They are also in your actual assignment. You can go and have a look at them. Um, she lists 10 practices that happen in a CLT classroom. I want you then to go and look at the case study and see which were used and which were not used. Okay, and why? So was, did the teacher reduce her, his or her speaking time? Was there scaffolding of the learning for number four? Number nine, did they vary interaction, for instance? Okay, so it's one of your questions. That is number two. You've got to go and identify six CLT practices that were used in the lesson. Take them and provide a quotation from the short story, from the case study, to show that that was the reason for it. But I'll go through each one of these questions with you in detail. So no one is maybe clueless, but maybe you've got lots of clues about how to go along with this. But I would invite you really to go and start looking at assignment one, read the case studies, check what Ferreira says. She also gives an explanation of what all these CLT practices are. So there's an explanation, go and read up with what she said so that you are pedagogically have understanding and prior knowledge before you actually go and answer the actual case study. Okay, it's 45 marks, 20% of your mark. Accept my challenge, go and check it out. So this is the outline for tonight. We're going to look at the curriculum and the language in the new democracy in South Africa. We look at the national curriculum statement, the, the curriculum with that. We're going to again look at language learning outcomes. I'm just going to shoot through that. We're going to quickly look at language assessments um, in CAPS. We're going to spend some time on Bix and Kelp. You'll see what that is. We've got some challenges in the new curriculum and then moving forward with the new curriculum. We're going to look at all those things. Quite exciting, I think. But it's basically to bring you up to date with what's going on with CAPS. So before 1994, um, there were different syllabuses for the different languages. For example, 
English and Afrikaans had different syllabuses or syllabi, and African languages had one common syllabus. So there were three different syllabuses. Um, also, English, Afrikaans, and African languages were all taught differently. Um, for example, the English language curriculum emphasized personal growth, and that meant they encouraged enjoying fun, use of the language, being imaginative and expressing their own ideas. Okay, this whole critical understanding and being imaginative, that kind of approach. Um, emphasized and focused on film study, visual literacy development, analyzing advertisements and cartoons, and bringing the visual element in. So this is how English was taught during pre-1994. Afrikaans, on the other hand, and African languages were given a structural approach focusing on grammar, all those rules that people love and language sounds, pronunciation, phonetics. I mean, um, so this was the basis of how you taught Afrikaans and and um, African languages. However, in the 1980s, Afrikaans moved to the same approach as what English um, how it was taught. And I think any of you that have studied Afrikaans as a mother tongue or as home as a first additional language will know that Afrikaans is taught in the same manner, um, emphasizing personal growth, being imaginative, visual literacy. Um, I'm not too sure how African languages are still being taught. I'm not sure if it is more grammar or is it also moved to the personal growth type of approach. So the curriculum's role in our new constitutional democracy, how was it? Um, so in 1994, the school curriculum needed to change to help our learners to participate in our new democracy. We were moving away from the old apartheid democ um, I wouldn't say democracy, but regime into the new 1994, which is our new rainbow nation. So in 1996, the essay constitution came about. And if you go and read the CAPS document, there's a whole part in chapter in section one about the constitution and how it tries to uphold that and that the need to, uh, to recognize all our 11 official languages. And the constitution says that everyone has the right to receive education in the official language of their choice. That becomes a bit difficult, I think, logistically, but that is the right of all people in South Africa, depending on what school you go to. So in 1997, the new language in education policy encouraged multilingualism, that you can use all languages in different schools, not only have one language, but you can have two, three, four, and that you had to respect all languages. Um, also, there was this whole emphasis that the learners Home language must be developed and kept. So if you see Koza or you see Zulu or you see Sutu, Afrikaans or English, you were entitled to keep your mother tongue and develop your language. And then to become fluent in one additional language, which is what we call additive bilingualism. I'll look at that now briefly. Um, however, the school governing bodies, the SGBs, had the power to choose what the language of learning and teaching would be, what the LALT will be. So although you could have your mother tongue being your language of learning and teaching, what happens is if the school decides English is the language of learning and teaching and your Isikosa, you would have to go along with it. Otherwise, you must go to a school where Isikosa is the language of learning and teaching. So you don't have that choice. It depends on the school governing body making those decisions. So from grade three, all learners must study in their LALT. However, if you go to a school where it's Afrikaans is the LALT, you'd have to do in Afrikaans, unfortunately. Um, otherwise, if you don't want to do that, you must choose another school where you can go and do it in English or Isikosa or Isisulu. Okay. So additive back bilingualism um, came about because the NCS has three statements for subjects at three different levels. We've got the home language one, which means it's learners who can understand and speak the language. You've got the first additional language. These are the three subject statements um, where they've got no knowledge or limited knowledge of the language. A lot of learners come into grade one and they don't know the first additional language. They might have easy Koza and they come into an English one and they've never taught, English, never spoken English before as well. But they might have a good knowledge of it. Then they've got the second additional language you can also take, which is often maybe even an official language. If you're doing English and Afrikaans, and you might then take it as a second additional, you might take Isi Zulu. Um, but it could also be a foreign language for some of the students. So, for example, in the Western Cape, a learner might choose to study in Afrikaans, home language, then English as a FAL and Isi Koza as a second additional language. They could choose that combination depending on the school governing bodies. In KwaZulu Natal, English learners could choose English as a home language. 
And if it's Zulu as a file or vice versa, that would be fine. Additive bilingualism um, occurs when your second language is acquired without losing your first language. So that means you will you've studied your first language to grade three, then you'll have your, your second language, but you don't lose your first additional language. So that's what we call additive bilingualism. It, it upholds respect for the person's first language and promotes a positive self-concept, okay, within the learner that there's nothing wrong with their home language, which is problematic when they come to schools where the home language, is, the, the lot is different to their home language. Subtractive bilingualism occurs when your, your first language or your culture is replaced by the new language, and that's what happens in many schools where they have to do the lot in Afrikaans or English, or is it closer, depending on what your language is. And this usually occurs in a pressurized context and often negative self-concepts are developed. So South Africa strives not to have subtractive bilingualism, encouraging learners to go to schools where they can use their mother tongue and then have the additive bilingualism. And that's the concept we really prefer. So post-1994, um, all languages needed to be treated equally in the schools. And you'll see it happens in CAPS. In 1997, the outcome-based curriculum was introduced with all 11 languages having the same approach. So that's why there's no difference between first additional language and higher home language. They're all exactly the same for FET and very much the same for, for the um, SP phase. So they all have the same treatment. So there's no difference between them except in the complexities as how they are differ differed in the way you deal with them. And for all the learning areas, share these seven general or critical outcomes in CAPS 1.3D. Go read it, it's all there. So they all share these critical outcomes. Um, and that the first critical outcome is that learners must be able to solve problems. Okay, so we don't want learners that are just saying yes or no. They must be able to solve problems, make decisions, and be critical in their thinking and creative in their thinking. So we want those kinds of learners to come through our teaching. Um, they must be able to work as a team or as a group or as a community, all right? So we encourage collaboration and teamwork. So in your classroom, ensure they're solving problems and working in groups, okay? If they're sitting all by themselves and not solving problems, you're not meeting the general aims from CAPS. They must organize and manage themselves. So give them team projects, which they must organize and take control of um, so they can work responsibly and effectively. Teach them to manage things and to organize things. Help them to collect and organize and evaluate information. They can do this by writing reports, doing surveys, um, using the internet to get information and then deciding if it's good or bad, but then let them do this in groups and to critically evaluate it. Yes, use visual, not only text um, or written text, visual text, symbolic text, language as well, different skills, using various modes from digital to, to hard copy to, to um, uh, visual, all these kinds of different things that you can use within the classroom. Recordings, um, listening to different, um, seeing different diagrams, pictures, and all that. Also, use science and technology. Okay, so you've got to use technology within the classroom, various media that you can use, um, recordings, visual recordings, audio recordings, um, overhead projectors, that they've got that, you can show visual as well. So they must look at this critically, especially looking at how they can be responsible towards the environment, sustainability, um, the carbon footprint, the green economy to promote all that, as well as health. So with the whole COVID-19 scare, flu, um, cleanliness, all these things, sanitization are so important, but to involve those things which are relevant to our learners and use that in the text materials that we're looking at as well. And then also just demonstrate world understanding, not only our local context, which is important, but how do we relate to the whole global issues that are surrounding us? What about corruption globally? What about load shedding globally? It's like some people don't know what that is, all right? And how do we solve this? We don't look at things in isolation. We look how we can solve this. How do we solve it for Africa, the whole thing of poverty, the of, thing of health? Um, climate change, how is that managed with Malawi now, also in the grips of um, Cyclone Freddy, which is also devastating that country as well. Right, so we're not living in our own little isolated world, we're living in a world that is global and how do we interact with that. So if you look at this, um, what involves language? Although language is only used in number five, 
to do any of these critical aims and decision making and thinking, we have to use language to communicate with each other, um, to talk about things, to integrate things, to be critical about things, language must be used. So all of these will involve language. So you have to be able to speak properly and use language. How often is critically used? Well, it's actually used three times here, but what does it mean? It means we must just accept things. Um, we must teach our, our learners to actually give reasons for the answers, to justify why they're saying things, not to say just yes or no, but why did they say yes? Why did they say no? Why do they prefer something? Why did they do that? Why are they late? Um, ask those questions, let them be critical about it. And it means that they can become creative thinkers and critical thinkers needed in our country. So let's make our students and our learners think as I want you to think as well. Okay. So if you're thinking critically, we've got a problem, give them problems to work out. Let them think about, give them space and a platform to think and let them find solutions. Debating is so important. Discussions are so important. Um, writing reports are so important to think contextually about these issues. Yes, and we don't forget Bloom's taxonomy. They also got the cognitive levels in CAPS as well. Um, if we just keep our students on the understanding and remembering regurgitation type, we not, they're not going to become critical, creative thinkers. Um, understanding and memory might be great, be fine for some of the comprehension questions for grade eight, but as you get on to grade 12, it must become more the analyzing, evaluating. You must think about the higher order cognitive skills as well. When we apply knowledge, when we analyze knowledge, when we compare knowledge, when we contrast knowledge, um, when we evaluate, give judgment. So it's not just understanding the what questions, it's how, um, why. Those questions are also important. Put your thinking cap on. So we're only in number two, but we're going to go fast now. The National Curriculum Statement um, com was completed for grades R to 9 in 2002, with the NCS for grades, FET levels was completed in 2003. So all are now covered by the NCS. They've all got the learning outcomes, which are similar. There are four documents for teachers that was part of the policy. We've got the National Curriculum Statement for grades R to 12. We've got the CAPS document for grades R to 12. We've got the learning and teaching support materials, the LTSM for all those grades. We've also got the National Protocol for Assessment, grades R to 12. So all these four documents are available. And if you go to www.education.gov.za, you'll see them all there. So I'm inviting you to go and check out the site. It's quite exciting. I went in there this week. And you can see they've even got the SONA implications for education from the Department of Basic Education, the State of the Nation address. How does that affect our schools? They've also got the current campaigns happening um, in education, the second chance matric support program, giving students who didn't pass a chance as a second chance. I like the read to lead campaign. A reading nation is a leading nation. The national teaching awards have also highlighted the 80.1 pass rate for 2022 NEC examinations, which is quite important. However, if you go to the site and look at curriculum, you'll find all past papers, memorandum. There's a wealth of information here. Go and look around, go and check all the links there. Um, every child is a national asset and go and see all the things that are happening in, on from the Department of Basic Education. Okay, the LOs for grades R to 9, we've looked at those already in last week, so we all know that they are the same, listening and speaking, which is for information and enjoyment, the same for reading and viewing, that's all covered in semester 1 for grades um, 8 and 9, writing and language will be all covered in semester 2. For SP, it looks at facts and in, imagine, imaginative writing for writing. And for language, it looks at use of sounds, words, and grammar to create and interpret text. So those are the kinds of things we look at the LOS for languages. If it is, you've also looked at this. It's still listening and speaking, but more, right? Variety of purposes and contexts. Still reading and viewing. It's understanding, but it's a whole range of texts that you've got to understand critically. More complex. And then next semester, again, writing and presenting also a range of purposes and audiences and language structures and conventions to appropriately and effectively use our language in all kinds of contexts. And that will be in semester two. So those are all the same, both FETs, 
both SPs, both home language and both first additional language. So there's a task for you, the NCS task. Check your grades um, that you're teaching. Um, compare the LOs for the different assessments for home language, FET and SP of your grades. Go and check them out. <clears throat> are there differences, similarities? Why are they all the same or why are they all different? So you're going to go and check out, especially for speaking and listening, compare the LOs. And are there personal growth opportunities within these similarities? And I want you to go and look on page 12 to particularly see that as well. So let's go look at language assessment now. Um, CAPS does not describe assessment as standard referenced. It is a mandated system of recording and reporting learner achievement. Mandated, they have to do it like that. Um, it has similarities to the standards referenced assessment. We will look at this later. But if you go into the CAPS document, I think it's in section four, you'll see there's a rating scale from one to seven, from not achieve your competence to outstanding achievement, from 0% to 100%, and you will either get a mark for number seven, but you won't know if you've got 80 or 81 or 99. Um, it doesn't say what your result is. I'll just give you a seven. Um, or if it's one, you won't realize how badly you failed. You won't know if it's not or 28. Okay. So you don't know the different standards, but those learner achievements are shown on these scales. Okay. Um, it's not in rank order, but just in the achievement levels that you'll see on the reports. And I'm sure most of you know about this. So um, go and check the assessments for listening and speaking for grades eight, um, the SPs or grade 10 to 12 or both of them for um, um, FETs. If you go to the FET, you'll see that for speaking, um, it's 20, it's two times 10. If you go and look at for listening for FETs, it's 15 marks that you'll get. Listen critically for comprehension, information, and evaluation. If you go and look at the SPs um, for grades seven, eight, and nine, it's all exactly the same. Nothing changes. It'll be the same for first additional language, and it'll be the same for home language. So complexity might change, but they will still have a mark out of 15, okay, for listening and speaking. You'll see there's another separate mark for reading aloud, which is another 15. All of these are the same, excepting for um, grade nine, paper two is only out of 30, whereas the written paper for the other grade seven and eight is out of 40. It's because um, in grade nine, you have a separate literature question out of 10, which together gives you the mark out of 40. But we'll look a lot at this and you'll get to know about it quite well. Number five, I think there's seven of them. Cummins is language teaching and learning principles, page 51 in Ferrer as well. Yes, Cummins says um, the English language learner is like this picture, and that is like an iceberg. And if you know anything about icebergs, you know you've got the top of the iceberg and you've got this massive chunk of ice at the bottom, which is the bottom of the iceberg. So Cummins says Bix, okay, we'll look at what Bix says, it's the top of the, the iceberg and kelp is the bottom. Okay, Bix is the basic intercommunication skills. Okay, that's my chatting skill whereas CALP is my cognitive academic language proficiency skills. That's my reading and my writing. So if you look at what Cummins says, there's the BIX part, basic interpersonal communication skills, and CALP is cognitive academic language proficiency, okay, which is reading and writing. So he looks, Cummins looks at BIX and CALP and says BIX is the social, that's our chit-chat, and whereas CALP is our academic it's the reading and writing, which is often more complex. So social is the top of the iceberg and academic is the bottom of the iceberg. So students acquire books quite quickly. They, we can chat away in Afrikaans, so maybe Zitkoza or Zulu and English, um, which takes one to two years to acquire the books. However, Kelp, the reading and writing skills, which are more complex, take a lot longer. It takes five to seven years to acquire the kelp of any language, all right? You, you're not able to just write something. Think about your second language. How do you read and write it, okay? It's not as easy as your first language. So because it's a deeper cognitive academic language proficiency that you need there. So your social is at the top, okay? Bix, can you see how small that part of the iceberg is? It's not very big, not very powerful. Whereas the academic is this massive giant. This is where it all happens, okay? And you have to develop the kelp as well, not just the chat, but the kelp proficiencies as well. 
So Cummins takes us to the whole concept of context embedded and context reduced. And I'm going to define these now. So acquisition depends on, I'm going to move my face here, on clues that are given. Okay. So what clues do we give a person to understand what we are saying? As I've been doing this today, I think I've been using visual prompts to try and give clues to what I'm saying and arrows and circles and things like that. Okay, let's try and get this moving again. Go there. It always happens to me. Okay, right. Context embedded. Let's first look at that. Uses concrete words like table, flower, lamp. Okay. Um, and it often uses nonverbal clues to try and make this understandable. So here's the table. Okay, I hit on here. I'll show it. This is the book. Okay, I'll show it. This is my verbal clue. So um, book, bread. Okay, there's a cat. Okay, so those things show different things. Um, and this makes sense because the person has the clue, so they get the big. So that's context embedded. And if you look again at the iceberg, it's our language for every day that we use. Our conversations with friends, our WhatsApp chats, um, informal interaction, we use the context embedded. Lots of informal clues, um, nonverbal clues. We smile, we laugh. And if you walk behind somebody, you'll soon get a feel of what they're talking about, even though you might not understand the language from the non-verbal clues. Kelp is something different. It's what we call context reduced. It's more abstract. Um, you have to rely on language. You have to understand the language to make sense of it. Okay. So for instance, they're talking about economic regression. If you've got no understanding of what economic regression is and that language knowledge, you will not understand what the person's talking about. So this is where it requires greater knowledge of the language to understand what people are talking about. Um, the language necessary to understand, discuss content in the classroom. So if you don't understand a geographical concept or climatology concept or any kind of concepts, scientific, physics, chemistry, all those important things, you will not understand the kelp and therefore you'll not understand what the person is talking about. So this is really quite deep. And it's, we've got to enable our students to get the kelp as well. And we show now what we do to get kelp, to understand that, to get the context reduced. This is what we call Cummins' quadrants. And you'll see there's an A, B, C, and D. Um, a says show, B says try, tell says, uh, C says tell, and D says do. Okay, what does that mean? Okay, what you've got here is we've got our context embedded, which is our concrete. It's the easier things that we can understand. So when you show and you tell something, it's easier. Okay, so here's my book. I just have to do this. Can you see how easy that is? Tell, book. Okay, but if I try and do something, try, if you say, take this book to your mother and give this to her to do that, it's, it's, it's actually a lot more complex. Or when you try and do something. Why? Because those are reduced. There's no clues for that. And therefore, we call that more challenging. So teachers must go for more the try and the do things in the classroom um, rather than the show and tell, because those are kelp, easy, and context embedded, or it's undermining and demanding. Here's another example. Cognitive demanding. Undermining is talking with your friends, whereas context reduced, which is demanding, is your writing and your reading, your maths concepts, your content classes are more cognitive demanding, it's context reduced, um, there are no clues, whereas the cognitive undermining, talking to your friends, is context embedded, lots of clues, it's easier to understand. So you've got the different quadrants. So for teachers, they need to design cognitively demanding, deep thinking activities, the do and the try, okay? even when they use caps. So to say, get your students to do something, come right on the board, come and put words on the board, come and try and finish the sentence. Okay, um, those kind of activities. No, just tell them to do something. Um, don't try and get them just to show things, but get them to do and try things. So design challenging interactional activities and scaffold the abstract academic tasks so they can actually do it. So it's not too, not too difficult for them. Let's just look at the, again at the, the iceberg. Um, 
Yes, if you're just doing vocab, pronunciation and grammar, it's the top of the iceberg. It melts away, it's soon forgotten. So if you think you're doing a lot of good work in the classroom and you're only looking at vocab, but not pronunciation and grammar, you're just concerned about the BICs, which is the basic interpersonal communication studies uh, skills, which is not going to develop reading and writing skills. If you want to do that, you've got to look at more analysis compare different things, contrast them, synthesize, put them together, evaluate different things. Semantic meaning, what is the meaning of this concept? How does it, what's, what functional meaning does this have when I use it like that? The more deeper things, even if you look at the cognitive processes for comprehension and application, are also still BICs. They are not deep enough to, and context reduced to make it more demanding. Don't forget Bloom's taxonomy, that the understanding and the remembering Explaining ideas or recording facts are all lower cognitively undermining tasks, whereas the creation, evaluation, and analyzing, producing new work, justifying a stand, drawing connections among ideas are the more cognitively demanding and challenging concepts we need to concentrate on. That's why when you design questions, you've got to be very conscious of the kind of questions you ask so that you are going to develop this more cognitive demanding and ability to use and understand context-reduced language. So improved teaching and language learning. Um, all students learn better when the academic content and language objectives are clearly explained. So as a teacher, you must explain what you're going to do in the class. What are your objectives for this lesson? And maybe only make it two, not 20. Um, what content are you going to look at? All right. Um, model it for them. Okay, we're going to look at synonyms today. This is how we're going to do it, all right? We're going to look at this text, because it must be all text-based. Um, we're going to write a poem, all right? What kind of poem are we going to write? What's it going to be about? Um, use visuals and graphics. You can see I use a visual person, I think, um, and supplementary material as well. Get them to use pictures, graphics, newspapers, um, magazines. Um, give them time to do hands-on learning, okay? Active. They must be active in the classroom. Um, let them do things, okay? Teacher mustn't talk all the time. Remember, 20% teacher talk, 80% student talk and doing things. Give them opportunities to go and ask questions, to to, to have a dialogue with a, with a friend, work out a problem, design a, power, um, a PowerPoint or a, a mind map. Task-based interaction. Everything must be related to a task, to a task and crop, co cooperative. I'm talking too much. Cooperative groups as well as for collaboration. Thinking and learning strategies are modeled for them. So help them to acquire um, speed reading skills of skimming and scanning and things like that. Yes, I think it's so important to build on their background experiences. Prior learning is so important. And then you can actually build on their knowledge and strengths. If you say to them, who knows about golf? And nobody knows about golf. You, you actually have got a very difficult lesson ahead of you um, because you're going to start from scratch, okay? Um, so rather do things that they all have a knowledge of. Yes, you've got to develop key vocab and not that you just tell them what the key words are or how what they mean. Let them actually explore those and cooperatively learn together what the vocab means. I quite like this Good learners go into the pit, okay, to, to understand what they are learning. And um, there's the challenge. Um, the easy way is to take this, this ladder across here, okay. Sometimes it might be harder, I don't know. But the hard way is to, to have a go, okay, try that, have a go. There is upside down. I don't get it. It's too hard. Hmm, maybe can I do this? I've got to get across here and there's a shark in the water. And they do. I think I can do this. That thing that I can get through the bottom, I can get up. Um, what else can I try? Yes, the, the interest is there. They want to work on it. I'll try again. They are motivated. You can help me. I'm not too sure. And you have someone sitting down this little rope. I'm getting there. Woo, I did it. That whole eureka. Um, the muscles are there. They're bursting there. But the whole joy of being able to do it. So allow your students to go into the pit. Model, help, support. Let them get out the other end often by themselves as well. So um, looking again at Bixen Kelp, this takes you back to Ferreira on um, page 52. Um, Mrs. Wallace has got a student called Kalani in her class, and she's concerned about his current performance in English um, because he can speak very well. Um, but there's a problem with his written performance. Think about Bixen Kelp. Um, he writes poorly, um, especially with tasks that have a strict time limit. 
And if you go to page 52, there is the very short case study and there are the questions I've got on the PowerPoint. And I want you to try and think about why is there a difference between his oral and his written work and why when there's a time limit. Okay, I'm going to discuss the answers with you in the next time. But think about it, especially thinking about Bix and Kalp, context reduced um, and context embedded type of learning. Think about it in terms of those things. So what are the challenges for the new curriculum? Teachers must be able to take all these LOs, interpret them, design the activities and implement them in the classroom. Think about sequencing and combining activities. Um, design your lesson units. Think about the different themes, the environments, the, um, those different contexts we have. We're experiencing now load shedding, corruption, so many things to talk about, health, strength, um, learning, so many things to think about design a variety of assessments, um, not only formal assessments, but maybe just writing a paragraph, listing a few points, um, doing a diagram, doing a brainstorming something, um, flow charts, all kinds of things you can actually do, design their own um, advertisement. Um, so also use media literacy as much as you can, so they can get using either books or magazines, so they can work with pictures and headings and, um, titles and letters to the editor, all kinds of text, form study where you can, um, that is very important, critical language awareness that they actually understand the use of language and or become very aware of how language is using to empower and disempower others. Um, should these all these aspects be included for African languages or should this still be a structural language approach that they do? Um, and how can we make more text available in African languages? These are things that we can actually debate and think about in the classroom. Um, interesting, this is from a past paper and the kind of content that's used as a text in a, in a comprehension. Teens struggle to combat conformity. Um, just think about the language. This is home language to combat conformity. It's quite an interesting concept they need to understand. And um, this is this little paragraph where they say currently teenagers conform to, conform to anything and everything to avoid standing out. So teenagers don't like to stand out for the fear of being judged and exiled by their peers. They do so even if they do not agree with the beliefs of the cliques to which they choose to belong. So the whole idea of combating conformity, it's relevant to our day and age of teenagers and how they're feeling um, need for confidence and different kinds of things that happen. So encourage them to be aware of this. He has a little cartoon following on the same type of theme. And if you look at the second um, second frame, it says, I will not conform to this madness, being like everybody else. I won't allow the corporations and their gadget zombies to define normal human behavior. If anything, they are the crazy ones, okay? And his friend says, I put peanut butter on my chest to keep the monster away at night. He says, is that crazy? And he says to his friend, frame for no, 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 not at all. Keep telling people that, okay? So when you say things, be careful of who you say it to. And there's quite a lot to unpack in here, but it's actually quite clever as well. Okay, I'm just going to look at this site here quickly where you can go and find reading material for your students. There's just so many free sites that you can go to to get interesting reading material. This is um, HTTPS, Um, Yes. Read now, they can go onto this online, it's free. The Family Guy about a person who gave up drinking um, and then goes to the church, but can he stay sober? The first one, The Family Guy, The Accomplice, it's about a young person who was um, inspired to become a lawyer by someone and he graduates as a lawyer, but then he goes and works with this person and discovers that this person is quite corrupt. How does he deal with it? And there's Mr. Wrong, Mr. Right. Mr. Right comes into your life. Um, and it doesn't seem to go as it should do. How can you, how do you know when Mr. Right is Mr. Wrong or Mr. Wrong is Mr. Right? Yes, Molly's friend for grade eights, um, but on Valentine's Day, um, does gratitude make you happier? Find healing through dance. These are written by young um, students. I um, love you to read these little articles that they write. This is the one I got this week. Escape, um, Zemtembe's father is a homophobic, uh, when rumors about his son's closer to the Zentembe's friend reach him, he's outraged. How will the family survive his prejudice? What's really behind it? Okay, so the whole thing about him being homophobic. 
is living a soft life for you with TikTok. If you've got an Instagram and video showing what everybody's doing internationally, um, designer clothes, um, what is a soft life? Is it something that you want? Look at these challenging questions you can ask your students and they can read this and talk about it. There's a competition for writing and here's the whole thing about the um, high cost of higher education, exploring the student debt crisis in SA from the 1st of March when we had this protest. We think about it and to be quickly about it, it's a wonderful thing for an FET grade 11 and grade 12 to discuss those issues that are confronting our students after the fees must fall thing in 2015. Okay, so number seven, the way ahead with the new curriculum, we're getting there, teachers will need to take personal responsibility for making sense of the new curriculum and put it into practice, it's all your responsibility, you need to discuss and share teaching practices more within the classroom, go and chat about it, go and chat about your friends, um, what should be a good teaching practice be, look at different textbooks, uh, for example, how to design a program of learning, Go on the internet, go look for different ways you can find. I've just found Pinterest has got so many things, so many materials there. Look and read and read and view or how other teachers teach. So go and visit your teachers. Go look at your mentor teacher. Go look how other people teach. You learn so much from them as well. So that's it from me this evening. Um, I'm going to sign up now. What's next? Uh, week three, we're going to look at communicative language teaching, but that's important for SS1. Um, communication is the key, yes. Um, if we can communicate, we can achieve so much. So I'm going to say that's all for now. I'm not going to take you there. Um, and hope you're all doing well. We'll chat soon. Any issues, things you're not too sure about, please get back to me. I am available on email. Okay, and you know how to email me too. So I'm going to stop my share now. And we get to stop there. Stop share there. And I'm going to say good night, good evening, and have a good week. Bye for now. It's a long weekend too. Bye.